What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Martian MMA Podcast. I'm your host, The Martian, also known as John, here to talk about the UFC card going down this weekend at the UFC Apex, headlined by a flyweight fight between Alex Perez and Tatsuru Tyra in a very fun fight. And the rest of the card isn't looking so hot. There's a few good fights on this one, especially uh, Tigir Ulenbekov versus Joshua Van. That really sticks out. Miles Johns versus Douglas De Silva Andrade. Uh, my boy Tim Kwamba taking on Lucas Almeida. Those are all decent fights, uh, but not the most exciting card. You know, definitely an apex tier card where it's just a lot of lesser known, uh, inexperienced fighters fighting on it. And. It's got to be expected, you know. We're kind of in the middle of a bunch of live events here. The UFC was live in Newark. They were live in Louisville. They're going to be live in Vegas at the end of the month. So we're kind of just stuck in between with uh, probably the worst card of the month by far here. But we're going to find some good betting spots as always, you know. Uh, there, there are betting lines. That means there are bets to be made. And even if the fighters aren't so great and the matchups aren't too exciting, there are some definitely uh, bets to be made. So we're going to talk about those here shortly in just a moment. Last week, I would say it was a, just a bad week for me straight up. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, a lot of stuff just didn't go my way and just was off on a lot of stuff. I mean, just way off on the Cody Stamen, the John Castaneda fight, the Charles Radke fight. Uh, you know, those, those were bad. The, the main event uh, went poorly because we bet that goes the distance. But I, I think that was a fine bet. It was just a weird, weird stoppage, obviously, a very controversial one. Um, really, the only fight I really nailed was the Dominic Reyes fight. I, I shot it out Dom Reyes, money line, KO, and KO won there. So those were all some big plus money winners. But the rest of the card, just uh, pretty bad stuff for me. So, uh, you know, apologies for, for some weak analysis last week and just got to, you know, do better on some of these fights. And uh, the last thing before uh, before we get into these fights is one of these fights might be in question. The co-main event, Ikram Ali Scarrow versus Antonio Tricoli might be possibly getting canceled. You know, there's a lot of a lot of news in the UFC world these past couple of days and weeks. And that is that um, obviously Conor McGregor is very likely out of the fight at the end of the month uh, versus Michael Chandler. And the UFC is scrambling to find a replacement. It seems like Conor's been probably out of the fight for close to two weeks now. And the UFC still hasn't announced it, still hasn't announced a uh, a new fight they're bringing in. I'm sure they're contacting a bunch of guys right now. But there's really not much to, to do. I mean, they have this fight, International Fight Week, in just about two weeks. And they have uh, most of their, their good fighters, their champions are, are either booked or just fought or unavailable. And they're really kind of grasping at straws. I imagine uh, some something along the lines of Max Holloway or Charles Oliveira coming in to save this card to either fight one another or possibly fight Michael Chandler. Those really seem like the only options, man. I mean, may, I was thinking maybe they'll, they'll move one of the UFC 304 fights up, but I don't know, man. You have, it's International Fight Week. It's supposed to be a big event. They already have a $20 million gate, and with Conor McGregor pulling out, I mean, this is just a huge, huge uh, situation going on with the UFC right now. I'm interested to see how they, they figure it out. But um, the other piece of news is that Kamzat Chemaev is out of his fight versus Robert Whitaker. And it's possible that Ikram Maliskarov might fill in there and fight Whitaker. It might be Nasruddin Imavov fighting him. So who knows? Uh, Ikram has sent out some tweets um, alluding to the fact that he might be off the card. But we'll uh, we'll get there, you know. We'll get there when we get there, you know. That's that's the second to last fight, and uh, we'll we'll tread lightly on that one. But with that being said, a little long winded intro today. We're gonna get things started. Uh, hey, long winded intro for me was still four minutes. A lot of these podcasts they'll be talking for fucking an hour before they get into the new fights. But we're starting things off in the featherweight division where we have Shaylian Nuradebeka taking on Mel Costa. Odds for this one have. Uh, Costa minus 188. Uh, <laughs> the be, best fight odds has his, or fight odds has his name Elin Shaw. When you know we the uh, the topology has it Shaylian Nuradebeka whatever. I call him Shaylian or, or Shalinian or some shit. You know he's not going to be in the UFC too much longer, so we're not going to have to perfect the pronunciation. But this fight is minus 180 Costa with plus 163 coming back with Shalinian and. 
Where the line's at now, I can't say I firmly disagree because I do think that, that Costa is the better fighter and I am going to be picking him to win the fight. But a few things worry me, and that is uh, Costa's defense isn't great. And I don't think he's very durable. I just think this guy could be on the fragile side. And Shalinian does sit down on, on a powerful overhand right from time to time. Uh, it's a funny comparison between these guys. They both fought... Uh, Steve Garcia, they both won the first round in pretty convincing fashion. They both slowed down terribly and got knocked out brutally in the second round. So they can't, they have that common characteristic, but um, Shalinian is a wrestler. He likes to take his opponents down. However, his top game sucks. He's a lay and pray artist through and through. He doesn't pass guard. He's not going to do anything with those takedowns. So let's say he takes Mel Costa down here. I don't think he's going to be establishing much. I don't think he's going to be landing offense or passing guard. So eventually Costa is going to stand his way back up. And I think Shalinian will probably just waste energy wrestling here. And the better jujitsu guy, the better control grappler is definitely Mel Costa. And I think he probably should have the better cardio as well. Although both these guys have suspect cardios where Costa obviously gassed out badly in, in the, the Garcia fight. Shalinian has slowed down in a few fights of his. Uh, probably the Garcia fight, the, the Jordan fight, he slowed down. But then he showed good cardio versus Sean Soriano, TJ Brown. Not really the greatest competition, but I'm going with Mel Costa here to win the fight. But I think that the... That the Chilinian knockout round one is the most interesting bet I see on this one. It's plus 1,200 on uh, bet online. I'm sure it'll open up at a better number. Uh, I was originally thinking this fight should go over, but now I think about it more. I could definitely see Shalinian knocking him out early. I could see Costa subbing him late. Maybe look out for those uh, Costa sub 2-3 lines because I think the later round should favor him, and he should be getting more comfortable as it goes on. But that's a decent fight to start off the card. I'll go... Um, I don't have a pick for the fight. The bets I like are Shalinian KO1 and Costa Sub 2-3. We're moving on to the strawweight division where we have Julia Palastri taking on Josephine Nutson. I'll answer this one. Have Nutson as the favorite at minus 170. Palastri coming back plus 145. Fun fight here, man. Fun women's fight. I'm interested to see this one play out. And a lot of action's been coming in on Palastri, man. She was plus 200 just about two days ago, and now she's all the way down to uh, just under plus 150. So definitely some action coming in on her, and I think it's the right the right action because if this fight stays striking, I believe it's going to be really competitive. Both these women are skilled strikers. Nutsen uh, really sticks to that Thai style where she uh, throws a lot of strikes to the body, and she does good work from the clinch with her knees and elbows. Not a big head hunter. She doesn't throw a, a whole lot of punches. Palastri, on the other hand, likes throwing headshots stringing together combinations of punches and both women have good grappling as well i think they both are capable of taking each other down but i think palastria has a little bit better uh grappling once the fight hits the floor nuts and i think kind of just hits those takedowns and stays in top but i think palastria is looking to accomplish more i also just think palastria fights meaner she looks to be hitting harder and she just brings a different intensity to these fights and i think nuts is going to be tested on the feet for one of her first times in her career i uh, just give palastria uh, you know, more aggression and i think she has more potential potential to finish the fight so I, I like um uh Palastri at the underdog price uh plus 200 was real good where it's at now um I would I would say there's still some slight value left on her but I I see this being just a really competitive fight and I think uh Nutsen is probably getting a little overvalued coming off of her undefeated record but a good fight there man I'm, I'm interested in that one it's a good women's fight there should be some good striking on display in that one and we're moving on to the featherweight division where you have jekka saragi taking on weston wilson where the odds have uh jekka as the minus 340 favorite weston coming back at plus 280 possibly one of the lowest level fights of all time here i mean both these guys are horrible and Jekka is actually coming off a win, but a little bit of a fluky win in that fight. Uh, just a weird knockout. Weston, man, this guy has been a, a lamb for slaughter in the UFC so far. Just got destroyed in both of his fights, and they're giving him another fight. But, man, I mean, he's horrible. However, when you have two horrible fighters and one of them is over 75%, I think it's pretty clear uh, what the only way to bet the fight is, and that would be taking some sort of Weston, Win Weston Wilson angle in this fight. It sounds crazy, but, I mean, I think Sarah Gee is just, you know, atrocious. And it doesn't matter that Wilson is also atrocious because his odds are near 3-1. to one. So I think a small bet on Weston Wilson here is totally warranted. This is going to be a hilarious bum fight, and cheering on your Weston Wilson wager is going to be a riveting affair 
And even though this guy's bad, they 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 threw him a bone and they gave him one of the other worst featherweights on the roster. So I, an actual winnable fight for Weston Wilson on the feet or on the ground. The guy tends to take the fight to the floor most of the time and does have most of his wins by submission. But I would even rule out him giving some uh, Jekka some problems with his southpaw striking, is you know karate esque striking that we're gonna see. So this is gonna be a great one. And honestly, this card is off to a, a tremendous start. And however, we're taking a little bit of a, a a step back in the next one where we have Gabriela Fernandez taking on Carly uh, Judice. Odds for this one have Fernandez minus 161, Judice plus 141. Another uh, women's MMA underdog fight where the action is coming in on the dog, and I believe rightfully so. I mean, Fernandez is terrible. Her grappling is absolutely atrocious. Seriously, one of the worst grapplers we've ever seen, possibly. Has no idea how to defend a takedown. No idea how to get off her back. Just completely clueless when it comes to wrestling and grappling. Uh, Judice, though, isn't really a grappler. She mostly keeps the fight on the, fl- on the feet, and she had that exciting fight on the Contender Series um, with Ernesta Caraceda, where it was just a, a high-volume, high-intensity, back-and-forth striking fight that entire time. And you got to imagine if this fight stays in the feet, it's probably going to be Fernandez throwing the bigger, uh, more powerful shots, but in less volume, while Judice is just going to be pumping out a ton of strikes like she did on the Contender Series. I think she landed, uh, they gave her like 180 significant strikes in that fight. So if it stays standing, it might be, a, uh, you know, a volume versus power situation and i just would be never ever looking to lay juice on gabriella fernandez i mean this woman is so horrible to the point where if if she gets taken down at any point She's not getting up. So how could you lay juice on a fighter that is completely inept when it comes to grappling? Couldn't be me. So Judice or pass is the only way to play it in my opinion, but at the same price where they are now, I think Palastri is the better underdog of the two. Uh, but man, that's a low-level fight. I, I, to be honest, did not look into that one a whole lot. So, uh, not a, not a convicted fight there. Next one is in the bantamweight division where we have Garrett Armfield taking on Brady Highstand in a fun fight where we have Armfield minus one ninety, Highstand plus one sixty-five, two uh, younger. I would say somewhat promising guys. You know, Highstand is still real young, only about I think twenty-five. Yep. And uh, Armfield is a little older, but I think he's had a good start in the UFC so far. He's only 27 and, you know, came into the UFC on short notice against Onama, took a loss there, but has had two solid wins. I mean, beat Brad Katona by decision. That was an impressive fight that he, uh, I didn't, I didn't score that fight for him, but I was impressed by him in that fight. And, you know, it definitely seems like these guys are a bit opposite with one another, where Garrett likes to keep the fight standing. Brady likes to take the fight to the floor. Garrett's cardio uh, isn't great, while Brady's is good. You know, Brady's tough. Uh, and he, he will pursue those takedowns nonstop. So Armfield's going to be defending a lot of takedowns here. I do think his defensive grappling should be good enough to, to, to fend off the takedowns early. And I do believe he should outstrike Brady Highstand pretty uh, significantly here. I give the edge to him by a good margin. But Brady's tough. He'll keep coming forward. He'll keep putting up those takedowns. And I think there's a chance the fight gets really close in the second half of the fight with Brady. Just his cardio being better. The fight. Uh, favoring him the more it gets into the grappling and you know we'll we'll see how Armfield's cardio and his defensive grappling holds up Uh, I think Armfield should definitely be the favorite but I'm definitely not looking to lay juice on him and I I have a bet on this fight to go over two and a half rounds because I believe that if Armfield is out striking high stand I think high stand is going to absorb the shots and he's going to keep coming forward the guy does seem durable to me and Brady's top game I don't think is great so even if he's getting these takedowns I don't think he's going to be a super imminent finishing threat on the ground here and that leads me to believe the fight's going to go the full 15 minutes where these two are are pretty evenly matched in a competitive decision i'll go armfield by decision as my pick but i'm certainly not as confident in uh, garrett's uh cardio and defensive grappling to be laying 65 percent on him here so i believe it is brady or pass and i believe brady has a little bit more room for uh, improvements to surprise us here with uh, with some improvements he's he's coming off a year layoff and we might see him uh, looking better here um, so we're moving on to the flyweight division for a few fights where we have in the first one nate maness taking on jimmy flick odds for this one have maness is a huge favorite minus 600 jimmy thick plus 425 i mean no way to bet maness here obviously he's juiced to the tits and Jimmy Flick is is pretty atrocious. You know, he's a big underdog. The guy has decent opportunistic, you know, uh, abilities. Though I mean, two fights in the UFC so far, I don't think he should have won. 
but he did just by you know capitalizing on one moment where he was able to take the fight to the floor or, or get you know Cody in that triangle. And the guy has very dangerous submissions, and uh, you know he's he's got 17 pro wins, and 15 of them come by way of submission. Uh, he has been knocked out six times, though. That's an insane stat at, at flyweight, especially. I mean, they should have a Jimmy Flick fight. Um, what's that bum who always gets knocked out from Australia or something? <laughs> um, I can't even think of his name at this point, but. Uh, He's got knocked out like four times in the UFC. Cody Durden knocked him out. Let me click on the Tapology link to, to find this guy. His wife left him. Uh, his name is JP Buys. There we go. That will be a good one. Uh, maybe throw in Shannon Ross for a little round robin with those guys. But, you know, obviously no way to bet Nate in this fight. Obviously his, two, his, his bets are just too juiced. And... Maybe look to fight, play the fight going longer, over one and a half at plus 155. I don't have a whole lot of, of takes here. I mean, Nate Maness's ITD line is at almost 75% here. That's absurd. And maybe flick by sub. I mean, that's really the only way he wins fights. That's plus 700 on some books. I don't know, man. Not a, not a really good fight to bet. We're moving on to probably... He, this is one in, one or two of the best fights of the card. Um, Tigir Ulanbekov taking on Joshua Van. It's a cr- it's a crime. This fight's on the prelims, but the odds for this one have Ulanbekov as the minus two hundred favorite. Josh Van plus one seventy. In Josh Van's short tenure in the UFC, this guy's already ascended to one of my favorite fighters. And I don't know how you couldn't love this guy. I mean, he's young. He's a fantastic striker. He's steadily improving. He's so so active. I mean, this guy he cranked out four amateur fights in the span of seven months. And he now has 11 pro fights in the span of just over two and a half years. Been in the UFC just less than a year. This is already his fourth fight. And man, I, I just I just love how active this guy is. I love his boxing style. This guy's a fantastic striker. He rips to the body. He rips to the head. He has a really, really good eye for exchanges. And I just, you know, can't wait to see this guy's future. Now, how, he, he is in a tough fight here against Tagir Ulanbekov because Tagir, significantly more experienced, has been trained in MMA for so much longer. And you got to imagine that Tagir has a pretty good defensive or, uh, a pretty good grappling advantage here, right? Joshua Van's takedown defense has not looked great so far. It looked okay in the Bunez fight, the Zumagulov fight, but you got to go back to his, it's his second pro fight, so he has improved a lot, in that, or third pro fight, he has improved a lot in that time, but he fought a guy named Devin Jackson, and he was just taken down a lot in that fight. He was put in a lot of bad positions. He got his back taken. Eventually, got rear naked choked at the end of the round. And it wasn't a, a horrible grappling performance. It's not like he got wiped out the entire time. He was able to escape. He was able to defend some takedowns. He was able to get the fight on the feet. But it just seemed like that relentless wrestling attack is a, a style that he could fold to. Now, Tagir isn't a relentless grappler. He does grapple pretty often in his fights, but it's not like the guy is known for hitting, you know, 10 takedowns a fight. He's not like a, a, a Mokayev type of fighter at flyway where he's just going to shoot the entire fight. But he will be looking to take this fight to the floor at some point. He likely will get the fight there, and he has a good chance of getting a back take on Joshua Van. When the fight's on the feet, it will be competitive. To gear is not a total bum on the feet, but you got to think Joshua Van's volume and his boxing and his head and body attacks will give to gear problems. And I just don't think to gear is a good defensive boxer. And I think he will be getting tagged on the feet here. And I, I think we're going to unfortunately see to gear press that grappling pretty hard, go to it successfully. And I, I think he will win the fight with his grappling. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if it'll be sub or by decision. I, I guess I'll lean with decision for to gear, but Man, I really hope Joshua Van wins. I think Van has the higher ceiling of the two for sure. I mean, Tagir has been in the UFC for, I believe, five years now, right, at least. And uh, first fight, no, only about th- uh, only a little three and a half years just about. But I don't know. I'm, I'm just definitely not as high on him as I am uh, Joshua Van. But, I mean, Tagir's impressed me lately, man. I mean, the Cody Durden fight I thought was an impressive performance. His grappling there was really solid. And I'm interested to see this one play out. Cannot wait for that one. Hope my boy Joshua Van pulls it off, but I won't be picking him to do so or betting him to do so. And uh, maybe you'll take a looking at the lines. Maybe Josh Van KO two three, uh, hoping that um, hoping that Tigir slows down. Uh, that's 16 to one, 22 to one. Those are pretty good stabs. That's the only way I could see myself uh, playing the fight. 
They have uh, Ulan Bekov decision. They have Ulan Bekov decision less likely than the sub, according to the odds, which I think is wrong. I think Van um, isn't going to get subbed here. I think he will stretch it out to a decision, but it's it's a dangerous it's a dangerous bet because we have seen a Van have trouble with back takers and getting rear naked choke before. So we're moving on to the main card where we have Adam Fugget taking on Josh Quinlan in a near pick'em fight here, closest line fight of the card. Josh Quinlan minus one twenty, Adam Fugget plus one hundred, even money. Um, I'm going Fugget here. Simple as that. Josh Quinlan sucks. Adam Fugget isn't a ton better, but I think he is definitely. Uh, the more versatile, the more well-rounded fighter of the two. And Josh Quinlan is just really inexperienced, man. I mean, he's only been to the decision one time. He lost that fight. He's been to round three a few times, but uh, got knocked out in his last fight against Barlow. I mean, he he got outstruck that entire fight versus Barlow and got hurt and knocked out. And his face was bleeding. His eyes were all puffy. I mean, he got fucked up in that fight. And that was just in February. So we're looking at four months removed from uh, not only getting knocked out but getting beat up the whole fight and getting knocked out so i wouldn't be looking to lay juice on quinlan in any stretch of the means and this guy has been just overvalued in, in a lot of his fights i mean he got steamed to to like minus 400 the day of versus trey waters and got like 30 27 in that fight he was only a slight underdog to danny barlow and i mean that was that line was completely wrong i mean he had relatively no chance in that fight and i just think there's a good chance he's getting overvalued again here and fuck it um not an impressive record nine and four he's he's one and two in the ufc so far but i don't know i think i like uh, i like fuck it in this fight a lot more and i do have a bet on him already i think plus money is great and i i, I probably would say fuck it is one of the best money lines of the card it's a low level fight but I, I like fucking i think he has a lot of upside i think he has way more grappling upside he actually goes to his grappling while quinlan doesn't i don't know who gave quinlan a black belt but i would be uh, looking to question that one and uh fuck it just fights mean man this guy gets he gets gritty in there he he's aggressive and uh i'm taking fuck it in, in this fight so we're moving on to another flyweight fight man a lot of flyweights this is going to be the fourth men's flyweight fight on the card where we have Asu Almabayev taking on Jose Johnson. Odds for this one have Almabayev as a big favorite, minus 600. Jose Johnson coming back at plus 425. Yeah, I don't see Johnson winning the fight, man. I mean, Almabayev is a relentless grappler. This guy just, he, he is a, a fighter who can, you know, I was talking about Tagir not being a relentless grappler. Asu Almabayev is a relentless grappler. This guy can shoot 10, 15, 20 times if he needs to. He can grapple the whole fight. He has cardio to do so. And his striking is not bad either. Now, Jose Johnson is somehow cutting to flyweight. You're not sure how that's possible. The guy is like, is he six foot? I mean, he might be six foot one. Maybe maybe I'm exaggerating. Yeah, he's six foot and fighting a flyweight. That might be a first. That might be the first time anyone's ever done that. And... Uh, He's a janky fighter, man. I mean, Johnson gets taken down a lot. His defensive wrestling is really bad. However, he's kind of learned how to fight through that where he's he's tricky to, to deal with on bottom. He throws a lot of strikes from bottom where he disrupts his opponents. He has decent sweeps and ability to get up and maybe even hit a reversal. If you watch his fight on the Contender Series, he fought that, that rat tail guy, Jack Cartwright, and got taken down a ton in that fight. However, he was just constantly elbowing Cartwright from the bottom and he hit some sweeps and he he just landed damage at every point he could in that fight and was able to win that fight uh, via decision despite getting taken down over and over again. So there's a small path for something similar to happen here, but Asu is just a way better grappler, much more fundamentally sound, much more experienced than that bum Jack Cartwright. So I, I see it being tough for, for Johnson to win the fight. It's likely going to have to be an early knockout or else he's not going to do it. And you, you just see Johnson get you know out grappled and submitted by a guy like Damon Blackshear, who's a good fighter, good grappler, but I just think Almabayev is a different level of grappler. So, you know, I see no reason to think that, that Asu isn't just going to dominate this fight in the grappling. Uh, but his sub line is, you know, at slight juice, minus 105. I wouldn't be laying juice on, on sub here. So maybe looking to play Almabayev by decision uh, at, at plus 200 would be the way I would be leaning to play the fight. But no, no conviction or bet on that one for me. And we're moving on to uh, another good fight in the... Bantamweight division this time where we have Miles Johns taking on Douglas De Silva DeAndrage. Odds for this one 
I added an extra duh in there. It's just Douglas Silva, DeAndrage. Um, but uh, John's minus 142, Andrade plus 122. I'm doing a little bit of a 180 on this fight where I've been pretty historically critical at betting against Miles Johns. And I've been a big supporter of Dion Drodge, but I'm going to be supporting Johns here. I did bet him minus 113 uh, just a few days ago. And I believe he will win the fight by decision. Johns is the fighter who is better than I've given him credit for. And he is improving. He His cardio is getting more consistent. He's just getting more comfortable winning these fights. And he, he has good cardio. He's a reliable, you know, three-round fighter. And he's winning a lot of fights by decision lately. While Andrade is a solid fighter, man. This guy always has been. And even to this day at the age of 38, he is a solid fighter. However, you know, Bantamweight's a tough weight class. And, you know, being 38... Not fighting too often, uh, right? He, you know, he hasn't fought in about 13 months. He he did beat Cody Stammen in that fight. It was close, and Cody Stammen looked like absolute dog shit last week in, in the Laplace fight. So I don't think that performance is extremely ex- inspiring for me. And um, you know, the Saeed fight was real close. The Morozov fight was a back and forth one. I think that one fight of the night, and yeah, it did. And you know, Andrade is a good fighter, man. I mean, I don't think this is going to be easy for Johns. I think Johns uh, isn't going to be, you know, soundly outboxing Andrade. I don't think he's going to be soundly out grappling Andrade. But I just give Johns a slight edge everywhere, considering he is more active. He's younger. He has a big, a, a better future ahead of him. He has more potential, and I just think this guy is is steadily improving and, and getting better with his boxing. He knows how to uh, hit the fight on the floor when he needs to. Although Andrade man has had historically pretty good takedown defense. I don't think Johns is going to be keeping him down for long, but some brief takedowns here from Johns could swing some rounds his way. Uh, and on the feet, man, I I do see it being close, but uh, Johns has has. Some good leg kicks as well that I think should be there in the the orthodox versus orthodox matchup. So I'm going Johns by decision here. Not a, a slam dunk pick or bet, but I do believe at the at the number of minus 113, I'm siding with him. And it's at minus 142 now. I would probably stay away where the current price is. I think this one is very likely to hit the decision, and it should be a, a competitive fight. But I'm going Johns with 29, 28 here, and we're sticking with. Uh, Another good fight in the featherweight division this time. Lucas Almeida taking on Tim Kwamba. Odds to this one have Kwamba as the favorite. Uh, minus 195, plus 160 coming back on Bavada. Uh, for some reason, the, those odds aren't available on uh, the fight odds screen. But I'm looking at Bet Online right now. And yeah, it's, it's Kwamba minus 190. So I think this fight has one of the best lines on the of the entire week. And that is for the fight to go the distance. Uh, They have this fight to go the distance at plus 140. The over is also plus money. And I like Tim Kwamba. I followed him a lot throughout his career. Tim Kwamba is not an aggressive fighter. He he fights very methodically. And, you know, half his wins do come by knockout, half by decision. But uh, I think when he fights other quality fighters, much more often than not, the fight is going to the decision. Um you know, the only fighter I believe I know that he finished was um, uh, Michael Stack, who's a solid fighter. Uh, and that was an, a nice head kick that got him. But that was just a perfectly timed head kick that caught him flush and knocked him out. But Kwamba, I, I very much believe that this guy wants the fights to go to decision, right? He he fights preparing for the 15 minutes. And I think that, uh, you know, Kwamba winning the fight, he is the favorite, definitely correlates with it going to the decision. The fight finishing, I think, favors Almeida more, who is a bit more of a wild and aggressive fighter and has a little bit more power and um, just uh, aggression behind the strikes, man. I mean, the Trezano fight, the Zellhuber fight, I mean, those were back and forth really good fights uh, where he was, you know, hurt. He hurt his opponent in that fight. Been on a rough streak lately, got absolutely dismantled in the grappling versus Pat Sabatini. Got quickly knocked out versus Andre Feely with a nice counter punch there. So I believe it's it's possible Kwamba could could hurt Almeida and and finish him on the feet because we have seen Almeida dropped and finished uh, you know finished in his last fight, but I just think the fight going the distance at plus money is really wrong, and Almeida finishing uh, Almeida no scorecards at plus money I believe is wrong, and I think it'll be. Um, a mix of Kwamba, uh, of competitive striking exchanges, and then Kwamba probably looking to take the fight to the clinch, maybe hit a takedown uh, and go uh, 
maybe kill some clock with, with a takedown on top here because we've seen Almeida get taken down very easily. Obviously, Kwamba is not the caliber of, of grappler as Pat Sabatini, but I do think his, his takedown should be good enough to get Almeida down at times in this fight. So I see it being competitive. I think the line is a little wide in terms of money line. But the way I'm looking to play the fight is just to go over, over two and a half and the fight to go the distance. I believe those are great bets and possibly the best bets of the entire card uh, in my eyes. Uh, I just, I don't understand why. Uh, I think most Kwamba fights should be favored to go the distance. I mean, no matter who the opponent. And Almeida is a more aggressive opponent, but it's not like this guy is an absolute wild man. You know, I don't think he, I, th I think there is a little bit of method behind his madness. Um, but the reason why is because Almeida has only had one fight go the distance in his entire career. That's why this line is the way it is. Uh, but I, I believe with the way they match up, with the way Kwamba likes to control fights and take it slow, I think. I think we're hitting the scorecards for a 29-28 competitive Kwamba fight here. A Kwamba win. Uh, we're moving on to the uh, middleweight division where we have Ikran Ali Skarov taking on Antonio Tricoli. And as I'm introducing this fight, I'm going to check Twitter to see if anything has been announced, uh, if this fight is off yet. Because, like I said, um, Ikram was giving a little bit of, uh, he was alluding to that something might be on the spectrum here about uh, him maybe taking another fight or him uh filling in for uh, the injured comps at Chimaev, like I mentioned in the beginning. But uh, Antonio Tricoli, or, uh, first of all, odds for this one, minus 1,600 Ali Skarov, plus 900 Tricoli. Um, Tricoli, I don't understand. I don't understand, right? Okay. He fought in the Contender Series in 2019. He wins the fight. I believe, yeah, it was a submission round one. He wins the fight. He tests positive. Okay. Then he doesn't get in the UFC. So he doesn't fight for two years, four months. He gets back in there, fights a total bum, takes him down instantly, submits him. Okay. Then somehow the UFC, it was like, okay, you want to fight? You're back in. Uh, you were impressive on the contender series, even though you failed a drug test. And then they brought him in to fight OSP. The fight got canceled. They brought him in to fight Omar Sy. The fight got canceled. And now he's fighting Ikram Ali Skarov. So he's had two fights in the past five years. They went six minutes in total. And he just took down two bums and submitted them right away. Uh, so who knows what to expect of this guy. We don't know We don't know what shape he's in. We don't know how he's looking lately. He hasn't fought in two and a half years. We don't know if his striking is any good. It, it, just even his fights before then, there's very little footage of them. It, I mean, there's just, I mean, he has, most of his fights were from 2016, 2019. I just haven't seen a lot of, of video available of them. And every fighter that you do you recognize, you know, uh, Volkman, Lima, Barbosa, uh, he lost those fights. He did beat Wendell Oliveira, who's a recognizable name. But I don't know what to make of Tricoli. I certainly don't think he, he's a, a threat to Alex Skarov. I mean, when the fight's on the feet, Alex Skarov is probably going to knock him out rather easily. Tricoli grappling is really I, the only way I see him winning the fight. And Ikram's defensive grappling is a bit unknown, but I imagine it, it's serviceable enough to avoid Tricoli here. So Ali Skarov shouldn't have much trouble, should probably knock him out in the first round. But all the bets on this one are just ridiculous. I mean... Uh, Ali Skarov minus 1600, Ali Skarov ITD minus 1000. I mean, there's just too much uncertainty, right? How how can anybody be over 90% certain he's going to finish when we don't really even have a, a clear idea of the quality fighter Tricoli is? I highly doubt he's any good, but, you know, I, did, I think this line is operating that he is just a complete turbo bum, which very might well, might well be the case, but I don't think there's evidence to suggest that, so... So you're operating on a quite a big assumption here to take uh, him to finish this fight just so easily. So I don't know, no bets, no bets on that one. But that's a stupid fight. <laughs> How is that the co-main event? This guy has fought has fought twice in five years, failed a drug test, has six minutes of fight time in five years. <laughs> His UFC debut, and he's in the co-main event. I don't get it. But regardless, main event time, flyweight division. Tatsuru Taira's first main event. Alex Perez is staying active. This is his second main event in, you know, a month or some shit like that. Odds for this one have Tyra minus 200, Alex Perez plus 170. Love this fight. Tatsuru Taira has been very slowly built in the UFC. He's had five fights, but against very, very subpar competition. Just no, not a single good fighter. 
Not a single good fighter in his past five fights in the UFC. Meanwhile, Alex Perez had a bit of a rough go of it, you know, over the past few years. Uh, got submitted in versus Figueredo, had a ton of canceled fights, got submitted quickly versus Pantoja, lost a close decision that he could have won against Mokhaev, but he he gambled on himself. He took the Nikolaou fight on short notice. He went into a main event on short notice against a guy who was preparing for five rounds. And, I mean, he looked phenomenal. Just boxed Nikolaou's ass off, knocked him out with one punch, which you don't really see much of flyweight. And I just think Alex Perez is getting more comfortable. He's getting used to fighting more. And this guy, he's always been really skilled, but he hasn't quite always been able to put it together. And with him being inactive over the past few years and fight him fighting just relentless competition with two former champs, the current champ, Pantoja, Mokaya, who's a, a top five fighter now. And I just think he's really getting into his own and he's, he, he's, he's going to be confident coming off that knockout over at Nikolau. So Tatsuru Taira you know, he's obviously going to be looking to take this fight to the floor. His striking isn't isn't horrible, but when this fight is on the feet, you got to imagine the more prolonged striking exchanges are going to favor Alex Perez, and they're going to favor the boxing of Perez and the combination punches, and we just don't really know how Tyra is going to look against a combination puncher, but I imagine it's not good because he's just so dedicated to get the fights to the floor that I don't think his striking will be... Uh, keeping up with Perez here. So when the fight's on the feet, it's, it's going to be dangerous for uh, Tatsuru Tyra here. Now, sorry, I had to do something on the computer. Sorry, getting back to it. Um, I like Alex Perez in this fight as an underdog because plus 170, I think that the only way Tyra looks like a, a, an easy favorite here is if he just gets easy takedowns and easy back takes and just dominates uh, and possibly submits Perez early. But Alex Perez is a really good wrestler. I mean, I, I forget who it was. I think it was uh, Fino, Fino Sky on uh, Twitter put up this thread of Perez defending takedowns and wrestling. I mean, you can just tell this guy is a great wrestler and offensive and defensive and that's really what you have to be at flyweight to, to to be at the top and i don't think perez getting submitted by pantoja or by uh figueredo is too indicative of what's going to happen here i mean i just think you know the Pantoja just caught him early. I mean, Pantoja just got after him early, took him down, got the back tape, just ripped that choke in 90 seconds. I don't think that was a super, you know, conclusive result there. And I don't think that's going to happen here because T Tatsuru is not as aggressive as Pantoja. His wrestling isn't as good. His back takes are phenomenal, and he does have a really, really good ability to take the back, to keep control of the back, and to attack the neck from there. But I just think there's only one way Tatsuru looks the 200 favorite here, and that is back takes. While Perez has just so much, so many more ways to win the fight, and I believe his He's not going to get taken down easily. I think he's going to have real potential to outbox Tyra badly on the feet. And even if he gets his take uh, taken down and his back taken early, he could defend, he could escape, and then he could use his more experience. And he has been scheduled for five rounds more. He's never actually been the five rounds. But this is a little bit more of a familiar scenario to Perez than it is to Tyra right now. Tyra coming over from Japan. I think he's been training in America for the past few months, but... This is a huge opportunity for Tyra. While this is just, you know, the this is the third biggest fight of Perez's year. I mean, he's been so active. He this is his third fight in four month third excuse me, third fight in three months. And like I said, this is probably the lowest stakes of all of them. So I can't wait for this one. I got Alex Perez in this fight. Um, I'll pick him to win the fight. Um not sure how it's going to be. I would maybe look at like a round three, round four knockout for, for Perez. Because if he if he's able to avoid these takedowns, avoid the back takes, and the fight gets stuck on the feet, I mean, he's going to be boxing Tyra's ass up. So those are some huge numbers for, for Perez KO 2-3, or 3-4. Or 2,000 for three, even 1,400 for round two. Uh, KO4 is 2500 man yeah I like a lot of those those mid round knockout props for for Alex Perez there but that's a great main event I'm looking forward to that one a lot um not a not a plethora of convicted plays on this one um some prop stabs in the first fight with Shalinian KO1 Costa sub 2-3 um, small bet on Weston Wilson money line, maybe even a little Weston Wilson submission round one uh, shout out to the my homie Chad 
the over two and a half in the uh, arm field and high stand fight. Uh, maybe Josh Van round three knockout. Adam Fuggett money line. Miles Johns uh, money line. Although the price has gone a little bit haywire. The goes the distance and the over two and a half in the Almeida Quamba fight. And last but not least, Alex Perez money line. Alex Perez mid round knockout props. That will do it. Hope you all enjoy the fights this weekend. We were off next week before uh, the UFC 303 pay-per-view at the end of the month. Who knows what's going to happen there. And it'll be interesting to see all the developments come out with that in the next couple of days or week. And I hope you all enjoyed the podcast. Thank you all for listening. Hope you all enjoy the fights this weekend. Win some bets. And I will see you all before the next UFC event in two weeks' time. Peace out, everyone.